Hello, everyone. Welcome um, to this panel. Uh, today we have re-entry for folks with uh, mental illness. Um, we have three incredible speakers that we are so excited uh, that we were able to get them on to share their experiences um, and give you all a little bit of their knowledge um, and their expertise. Um, so today we have Pastor Troy Vaughn. He is the co-founder and executive director of the LA Regional Reentry Partnership. That is dedicated to creating viable housing and employment solutions and system-wide changes for formerly justice-involved individuals. Which, by the way, uh, Pastor Troy, I love that. Formerly justice-involved individuals. Excellent way to put it. Uh, chief Adolfo Gonzalez is the Chief Probation Officer of the San Diego County Probation Department and has been working on a lot of different innovations to support individuals with reentry. Uh, Mark Gale is a family member and the Criminal Justice Chair of NAMI Greater Los Angeles County. Though he wears many other hats advocating for change, like um, Chief Gonzalez and Pastor Troy Vaughn, um, they're really advocating for change within the mental health system and the justice system at its core. Um, and so we are thrilled to have the three of you today um, to share a little bit about your experiences. And with that, I'm going to share my screen um, to go ahead and start with Mark. I'll pass it over and you can go ahead and go through your slides. Thank you. Have them up here in a second. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Nami. Nice to see you again. The um, so actually, I was going to call this from arrest to reentry, but actually, it all starts in the community. So um, uh, I want to talk about what we would call intercept zero. Next slide, please. If anybody has any questions, you can take down my Gmail address and email me offline and we can talk about it. So this is what I'm currently involved in. I don't want to take up a lot of time. I'm going to whiz through these slides very quickly because I want you to listen to our reentry experts today. Uh, but this is uh, my current involvement with NAMI as criminal justice chair and the work I'm doing with the county and the court system. Next slide, please. So, you know, how I got involved just the way all of you did. I learned about mental health care through navigating my son's treatment and his intersection with the criminal justice system when he was arrested many years ago. I finally found NAMI, started getting some help and support, uh, just like all of you. And this led to my involvement in advocacy, which actually became an important element in my own recovery because families need to recover too. And uh, I stopped falling apart when I started becoming an advocate and it worked for me. So it doesn't work for everybody, but that's what helped me recover. And I really learned about the public mental health system from all of you who came to me with questions and said, this is going on in my family, How, what do I do? So really the families uh, and the peers were my greatest teachers about what really is the mass incarceration of people with mental illness. Next slide. So the sequential intercept model, uh, many years ago when I gave presentations on this, nobody knew what it was. I think today a lot of people know what it is. If you're familiar with the Stepping Up initiative, uh, which NAMI has been very uh, involved in, then you know about the sequential intercept model. And it's really a roadmap through the criminal justice system. Uh, it divides the interaction of justice involved individuals with serious mental illness and the criminal justice system into intercepts which is uh, a fancy way of just um, going through the chronology of a case. And really when you, uh, as, the, as the model continues and as you'll see, every time this, you go to another part of the system in a criminal case is an opportunity to offer treatment to somebody. And that's really at the heart of the, of the SIM, of the sequential intercept model. Next slide, please. And I'm not going to talk about it. Now, this one's too big. If you can make it smaller, they can actually see all five intercepts. But this is sort of an old slide, but it gives you the idea of the five intercepts and what they look like. So intercepts zero, zero is community services. Intercept one, law enforcement. Intercept two, initial detention, preliminary hearings, mental health court. Uh, moving on to intercept three, which is jails and specialty courts. 
And then I figure if we were going to talk about Intercept 4 today with our reentry uh, colleagues, uh, you needed to know what the three or four intercepts before it are. And then Intercept 5 is after reentry and discharge back into the community. And actually, the Alternative to Incarceration's work group here in Los Angeles, we've divided it into seven. So we've taken it. Next slide. And then you're going to have to. All right, so this is real quick. I'm not going to read these numbers, but uh, to show you when everybody says, well, we can't scale it up, we can't handle hundreds and hundreds or thousands of people, um, Los Angeles is doing it. And you can see by the numbers that many, many people are getting uh, help. And I remember when uh, Troy and I were on the Permanent Steering Committee for the Office of Diversion and Reentry. And uh, our district attorney says, this is great, but it's only 25 beds or it's only 50 slots or 50 beds. And as you can see, we've grown that considerably. Next slide. Uh, Intercept Zero is really um, about the failure of the mental health system. If you have, we have an incomplete behavioral health care system, we don't have timely access, in some cases, any access to the level of care somebody needs. And the failure of our society by allowing that to happen is an acceptance of the mass incarceration of people with mental illness. And that has had huge act, uh, impact on individuals and their families. We've got uh, failures of outdated law that need to be reformed, a failure for the system to partnership for families. And when all this explodes into the catastrophe of the criminal justice system, um, when you've got nowhere else to go, jail is the bed that never says no. And that's got to stop. Next slide. So then we move to an interaction has occurred and you have an initial contact with law enforcement. For those of you involved in crisis intervention team training, this is an intercept one. And of course, our partnership. Um, if you've looked at the sharing your story with law enforcement program from NAMI National, that is the online NAMI National adaptation of the NAMI Los Angeles, uh, Greater Los Angeles County. Uh, presenter training program for CIT. Next. You move to intercept two. There's your initial detention, your first court appearances. Uh, so this is sort of the setting the stage for my colleagues to go to intercept four. Um, you identify people who have serious in mental illness during jail intake and pre-child services. And as I said before, each contact in court is an opportunity to offer treatment and diversion. Next slide. Intercept three, we're not going to talk about jail today. That's a subject all on its own. But I'm very involved with collaborative problem solving courts. I'm in my fourth year with the Collaborative Courts Justice Advisory Committee for Judicial Counsel. Um, so as uh, the pro Chief Gonzalez and Troy are working more on the back end of the system in reentry, most of my work has been in the front end. Uh, there's jail in reach. And really, the reason we need collaborative courts is everybody comes home someday and everybody's going to need services and supports. And if you don't provide them, you just get more recidivism and more catastrophe. Uh, the collaborative court tries to blend the adversarial criminal court process with treatment and services where you're focused on outcomes and linkage instead of convictions. Next slide. And then intercept four. Uh, which our, 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 my colleagues are going to talk about is reentry from jail or prison, which are very different sometimes uh, uh, processes, which uh, they can identify for you. There's been a tremendous lack of community supports and services, particularly for parolees. Uh, AB 109 has helped with probationers, but uh, a lot still needs to be done. And uh, we want to set up people with mental illness when they return back to the community. We want to set them up for failure or success. So our, our, our two reentry experts, Chief Gonzalez and Pastor Troy Vaughn, are going to take it from here and talk about Intercept 4. And thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Mark. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Troy, and he will be sharing his slides. And Troy, you're on mute. Sorry, let me load this up. Uh, okay, great. This slide goes down. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's 
here. Here. Share's phone. Oh, share. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're good. Is it sharing? Yes, we can see your PowerPoint, but it's not full screen yet for us. Okay, let me do slideshow. Excellent. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is um, Pastor Troy Vaughn, and I am co-founder and executive director for the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership. I wear many hats, um, consultant with the county, um, president and CEO of LA Mission, and also Christ Center Ministries. And, you know, we provide a lot of services for um, your population. Um, just a little bit about um, my story today, um, an overview of who LARP is and how we interface with county systems and state systems to help um, deal with the impact of returning citizens back into our society. And I think a little historical context, because I think that we're really trying to dismantle the system. We need to know how we got here and then what does the reentry landscape look like now, what's working, and then some next steps. Um, you should know that uh, I'm a former Marine and um, with, um, you know, I had a felony record that's since been expunged and uh, um, um, dealt with my record, but I was dealing with drug and do psychosis for a number of years. I was living on the streets, um, out of um, jumping train cars, um, cardboard boxes, dealing with um, um, drug and do psychosis. So I really um, had issues in my own life. Um, and so that's why I'm really connected to this work through my faith and through my own process of transformation. Um, but it's really about empowering people. And I think that when we see people that experience, um, you know, mental health issues or co-occurring disorders, that we really don't need to see them as invisible, but as human beings that need an opportunity to be served. Um, because a lot of us are dealing with it either directly or indirectly through a family member. And so my work really um, exists around um, creating change among many systems that converge into um, the process, whether it's criminal justice system, homelessness, poverty. Uh, my work centers around all these systems and really looking at how we can deal with the racial inequities for people of color or just involved populations. LARP is a network. Um, right now, we're about a network of a little over 750 public and private organizations. And we work together to deal with issues around um, that affect our reentry system. And so we meet the need, um, the people that are returning back into our communities by um, providing them housing. We have education services, employment, integrated health, policy and legal, faith, civic engagement, and, and regional offices, both in uh, Antelope Valley, um, Pomona region, Long Beach regions, um, and West Los Angeles, and then our, our mid-city um, um, Los Angeles area, which is our, our main LARP hub, but we have four other regional offices that are displaced throughout the Los Angeles County area to help community-based organizations work together with um, justice um, partners to really deal with um, the issues that surround our citizens as they're returning home. So our mission is to support the development and implementation of a comprehensive, cultural, competent, and effective community reentry system by providing a strong community voice and public policy and funding decisions by serving as a convener of, of reentry service providers, advocates, and other community stakeholders in building capacity across the county to meet the needs of the reentry community. You know, and so for me, it's really about understanding that we're here because there's a lot of decisions that's been made in our nation that um, really we need to understand that in order for us to really deal with it, a lot of these laws that are on the books that a lot of times we don't see these invisible laws um, that really have impacted us for so long that has contributed to um, an, an exasperation and um, an over saturation of people suffering from mental health issues and co-occurring disorders on our streets. Um, you know, we, we can understand that um, the racial, um, racial um, reconstruction and birth of um, organizations that have been anti-American, 
Um, and then when we look at different laws like the Jim Crow laws that have contributed to um, mass incarceration for people in color, um, civil rights movements, and then the Nixon war on drugs. And this is really in my mind where it begins to really um, solidify a mindset of our nation against people that were suffering from um, issues. Um, and then we see that Ronald Reagan repels the mental health system um, act um, that was initiated by Carter. And then when that started happening, and then we started getting the Just Say No campaign, as a society, we started saying that people who were suffering from mental health issues or issues with drug use, that these people weren't valued as regular citizens. And so what we see now is the result, the historical result, a lot of that, um, those decisions that were made back then. And so in order for us to begin to um, change that, we have to change some of these laws as well. And so we see a lot of people experiencing um, 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 high levels of acuity that are in the um, prison system right now. Um, in 2004, um, Department of Justice, 10% uh, of the people in prison had some kind of disorder, uh, mental health disorder. 55% experienced homeless have an emotional or psycho, uh, um, psychology, uh, um, a psycho disorder that they're dealing with right now. And so we need to understand that this system that we're dealing with as it relates to mass incarceration and people coming home, they're coming home with a needing of assistance, right? 35% um, decline in mental health treatment in federal prisons from 2014 to 2017. And so when we see that treatment has not been at the forefront in our own um, institutions, then we have to start doing something and putting um, um, services at the forefront. This, this information, I'm not going to read it to you, but the socioeconomic status in turn is linked to mental health. Um, people who are impoverished, homeless, incarcerated, and have substance use problems are at higher risk of poor mental health. And so we're not dealing with the social determinants of health in our society, that we're really not ever going to scratch the surface on being able to help people really um, make changes. I, um, I sit on the, um, I chair the Programs and Services Committee for um, the closure of Men's Central Drill right now. And one of the things we're looking at is um, the, the level of mental health um, treatment levels or health levels that are happening within our jail. And we can see here that we have severe um, 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 debilitating systems and significant impairment, moderate impairment, mild impairment, and then no current impairment. And so these levels of mental health um, 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 needs are currently in our county jail system. These are the individuals that are coming from state prison to county jail or leaning back into county jail, those people that are still on our streets and this, um, this uh, perpetual cycle um, that is happening is really not doing anything to um, benefit the people that are returning back into our streets. And so when we look at these levels, what we're saying is that um, there's people in the system and we just created these mental health hospitals that are really jails, but are not really treating people at all at the level that they need to be treated. And so right now, what we're trying to do in terms of reentry is um, a, a, a reduction strategy is being proposed and put on the table. And so we'll be looking at how we're going to do it. And so we have um, almost 4,000 individuals that have to be relocated or moved out of the jail within the next year. And so we're working, as Ma uh, Mark was saying earlier, that um, we're looking at these intercept models um, and connecting with the ATI process. And a part of our work is the, the closure of the jail process is a little different than ATI, but it dovetails together, meaning that people that are coming back, they need a place that they can go to, but it's not just about putting them in a bed, it's about also making sure that they have comprehensive services attached to it. So we have to do several things. We have to reduce the population across the entire system to free up space um, for people who cannot be released from jail right now but also um, then move those people back into community-based housing. And so we're looking across the entire landscape of LA County in order to do that, um, looking for um, you know, capacity opportunities, um, collaboration I think is gonna be key for us to really begin to work together to understand what the issues are, including incorporating families. And a lot of the um, 
um, NAMI um, population is you guys really focus on the family piece. And I really appreciate that because we won't be able to really deal with the issue um, that is surrounding our returning citizens until we incorporate family in the decision making. And so really what we need to understand, there's two modalities that's being incorporated right now and discussed. One is a community treatment care coordination plan and the other is treatment and care within facility because we won't be able to realistically move everybody out of the system um, at one time. And so we still got to focus on what does care look like for people that are actually still in the system and then what does care look like when people are returning home. And so we're, we're really having great conversations right now about incorporating that in our process. Um, this is just kind of like um, some outcomes of what we can begin to focus on. And I really want to talk about really understanding access to care, because I think that when people are returning back into our communities, the first thing we need to make sure prior to release is that they have access to care. Continual care is going to be central and key. In 2018, 58% of Black and, um, Americans and African American young adults, 18 to 25, 50% of adults 26 to 49 with, with serious mental illness did not receive treatment. And this is a problem, right? Like if we see in our society um, that people are not being treated and not have care, we're only contributing, um, contributing to the, um, the issues and we're not really um, facing them, nor are we dealing with them at all. And this is just a slide that just talks about um, the disparity in terms of incarceration rates um, um, by ethnicity and race in our society. And when we look at this, and the reason why this is important, because if we don't begin to understand that everybody needs to be treated on the same level and playing field, then we just have a problem in our society and we're never going to fix the issues. Um, we have to begin to see ourselves as one human race um, and begin to deal with the issues um, as it relates to everybody being impacted. Um, here's, here we are, right? since the um, exposure in terms of the pandemic, we, we see that the pandemic did a couple of things. One, it, is, it, it, it exposed the racial disparities like no other event in U.S. history has done, in my opinion. And we begin to see that really healthcare is really central to us understanding how we want to begin to deal with um, people that are returning home. And if we're not going to look at it from that particular lens, then we're doing ourselves as a nation and as a world, I think, as a human race, a disservice because we're really saying that we can only deal with it in these segment places and we're not looking at it in totality. Um, and so we, we really need to um, understand that. Here's some ad additional numbers in terms of people that are being incarcerated and released back into our community. I mean, when we look at what's happening as it relates to um, people of color, we can see clearly that people of color, whether they are Pacific Islanders, Latino, indigenous people, um, black people, um, that they are, um, their mortality rates are off the scale. So how do we begin to um, deal with this issue? I think the only way we can deal with it is really looking at it um, one bite at a time, right? Really, it's so complex. Um, the, you know, the reality is, is that it's, it's, it's overwhelming when you think about it from just one lens, because it's really not just one lens that we need to look at this. So we need community partners. We need to understand the collateral consequences of the decision we're making today just because they didn't do that in, in our past, in our history as a nation, but we need to understand the collateral consequences. And that's why I always like a balanced approach, because I really think that when we over advocate for one thing, but we don't understand the collateral consequences of those decisions that we're making, that we can be exasperating the system, whether that's in our judicial system or our institutions, we need to make sure we do it with soundness and prudence. Um, the changes are done with soundness and, and prudence. And so for me, in order for us so, to do it, I focus on a, um, a model of community-based restoration. At our organizations, we have housing models that focus in on people that are returning home with mental illness, understanding what we need to do, um, re, re, um, um, looking at relapse prevention, reoffend and release, um, reincarceration. How do people come back into community? 
And so um, that's really at the core of what we're talking about here. How do people come back into the community in a health in the most safety, uh, in, in the safest way possible? And for me, that has to do with community-based restoration. Is that my time? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you I, so much. I don't really know how much time we had. So. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Troy. And we will definitely be able to come back to your presentation, especially during the Q&A. There's a lot of gratitude for your presentation um, happening in the chat boxes and also some questions that are coming up. So we'll get to the questions um, as soon as we wrap up with um, Chief Gonzalez's presentation. Okay. But thank you so much, Troy and Mark. Uh, right now, we're going to pass it over um, to Chief on, Gonzalez. So if you want to just. Stop my presentation, hold on a second. Yeah, if, I was going to say. If you want to, yes, there we go. Perfect. Can I stop it? Yes, that was it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and share this one. And so Chief Adolfo Gonzalez, go ahead. And you are on mute. Good morning, Nami, and everyone for being here. Uh, special thanks to Mark, um, Gail, and also uh, Pastor Troy Vaughn for your story. Um, I too have a personal story, um, family members um, who are suffering from mental illness or living with mental illness, I call it, um, been in and out of the system, judicial system. And uh, I think we can make a difference as we've heard already through a community effort and not just um, through law enforcement, which is a big, big concern to all of us. Next slide. For the second time, I'm gonna go through each and every uh, slide or comment just to say that as you heard already, uh, statistics show us that one in seven uh, justice involved clients have severe mental illness. And our clients are more, twice as likely to receive a failing probation or supervision because of the condition. And oftentimes, if it were not for the mental illness, the crime would not have occurred. So what we're looking at is what can we do as probation officers as you know, we are an arm of the courts. We work for the, uh, for the courts in, 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 um, in serving our clients, but they come to us through law enforcement. And our focus here will be to try to work with our partners in law enforcement to find a way of getting some real solutions and not just uh, incarceration. Because I can tell you, incarceration is not an answer to our problems. Our probation officers have done a great job and I'm very proud of our officers here in San Diego County. Uh, they're both law enforcement in one hand and they're rehabilitative functions on the other hand. They um, are what I call focus on uh, accountability at the same time hoping, uh, hoping for opportunities. And the opportunities, next slide. And the opportunities would be to what can we do to serve our returning citizens uh, better. Our reentry program with our behavioral health supervision unit uh, meet with the clients um, while incarcerated so that we can work with the courts the public defender, the attorneys, the DA, the sheriffs, and other community partners and family members to see what can we do to prepare for reentry. Uh, and one of the biggest key we found is in order to build the reentry success, you have to have a trust, a bonding trust between the client and the service providers. Next, next slide, please. So we identified five elements for the behavioral health unit that I think have been successful for us here in San Diego. One is the caseloads can only retain or maintain severely mentally ill clients, not a bifurcated case where you're having um, other, other individuals in your caseload that take time away from your service to our um, individuals that need more um, services that's going forward. For example, having smaller caseloads. When you have 60, 70 or more cases, you really don't have time to devote to one particular individual. Having cases that are 30, 40 will give you that opportunity. And also continue training for the officers with specialized training, medication, behavioral health, uh, trauma-informed care, learning about uh, diagnoses. And I can tell you that our officers come to the behavioral health unit because they want to make a difference. They want to show that they care about our, 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 our clients. We call them clients. Sometimes we call them uh, behavioral health court uh, members. Uh, you'll hear that in a minute. But it's also working with our partners internally and externally to provide those services. And the early on we, we get to our clients, the better off we're going to be on the back end. 
And of course, the last um, point here is having a problem solving model or strategies that you're looking at the root cause of the problem and not just the, the symptoms, but finding out what's really causing this, this kind of uh, lack of uh, services, whether it's housing, beds, um, treatment, medication, or, or what have you. Next slide. And one of the things we do here is we work very closely with tsunami um, uh, support groups. Uh, we often link our clients and their families to NAMI support groups and also to the educational services provided here in NAMI. And as I heard this morning, another thing we'll be using is the nine one, excuse me, the nine eight eight uh, call where they can call for assistance and help. And I like that dare to care. And part of our, our value is that we're caring, compassion, service oriented here in San Diego to provide better service to all of our clients. Next slide, please. The Behavioral Health Court is a special, and you heard earlier about collaborative courts. We have um, drug court, behavioral health court, veterans courts, reentry courts. And in this case, the Behavioral Health Court are run by one judge. So she gets to see um, both the diversion and the uh, behavioral health clients that we are, are looking at. Very quickly, I'm not gonna read through all this, it's available for you. Uh, this is a program to self-pace. Uh, we're looking at housing plans, medication compliance prior is prioritized. And if a person completes a program, some of the charges will be dismissed. Again, if it were not for the mental illness, they might not, they might not have committed that offense that got them into, into jail. Uh, next slide, please. In the behavioral health court diversion, this, the, the individual is really not on probation, um, but we wanna help them through this process. So we uh, work with them to agree on the program or conditions and we help them through the process so they can at the end of the program, if they're successful, have those uh, charges dismissed and any record of their arrest to be sealed. So there's no record of it going forward. Next slide. So one of the things that we do is talk about having the direct contact. If you let someone out of jail or, count or prison and expect them to come to their home and get treatment, more than likely they're gonna fail. So we like to go and pick them up at the site. So we start working with our providers, uh, Telecare for example, we transport the clients from jail directly to their sober living home or wherever they're going. We also have probation officers that are our transportation unit that can do that. And you also have probation officers who have clients go to the jail, pick them up and take them to where they need to be. So there's no gap in, in uh, connecting them from the jail to the facility. And of course, the uh, providers a 24 hour number hotline in case they have a crisis once they're released. Next uh, slide, please. Probation, again, probation officers, this group, I can tell you, uh, I'm so proud of them that they're so dedicated that they even provide their personal county phone numbers to their clients and they get calls day and night when, when their clients are, are, are needing assistance or in a crisis. So in order to assist them, um, they get out there, they get the services to their clients and make sure that they get a treatment or services instead of getting arrested and going back to jail. They're in constant contact with uh, uh, telecare uh, providers as well as the uh, house managers where our clients are staying. And at times, if we need be, we can call um, the, the third team, the crisis response team to assist us uh, as appropriate. But one of the biggest things we like to do is uh, communicate with the family members, but we can't talk to the families without having a signed consent form to allow us to do that, as you all know, because of HIPAA. Um, getting the families involved early on before the uh, individual returns home is key. But as you know, many times the victims of those crimes were family members, as it was in my, in my particular family's case. Next victim, give me the slide. So what do we do? We have a graduation um, when they complete the program, and I've been to a number of those graduations, and it's exciting to hear their sto individual stories. But this is a team uh, a concept between the judge, the DA, public defender, the treatment providers, and the behavioral health court member himself or herself. And upon completing all the requirements, we ensure that they have adequate housing, also psychiatric assistance or therapy, funding or sources of employment, insurance, primary health care, all the things they're gonna to need to be successful. And then they have a graduation. Upon graduating successfully, the case is terminated from probation. And at times the criminal charges are reduced or eliminated. Next slide. So what we did back in 2013 is partner up with uh, providers, treatment staff, mental health clinicians. 
we created what we call the Community Transition Center. And what we do is that we actually uh, go and pick up the clients once we know they're being released from prison. This is part of the AB 109 program and we bring them to our center. Uh, next slide, please. When they come to the center, we focus on the whole person care. There's a full assessment, physical, um, mental, and if they need services, they're providing linkages. Uh, we're advocacy, we're, we're strength-based, and we're really looking at what can we do to help recovery. And as the same appearance says, it's, it's getting the people out of prison by getting the prison out of the people. And here you see a very diverse group of people that we have. Uh, we're able to um, acquire this hotel that was abandoned uh, through the county. We obtain um, providers that assist us 24 hours a day, taking care of our clients. We try to get them the services here. And once they're ready to move out into the community, whether it's temporary housing, interim housing, any type of, of, of group housing, whatever we can find, we, we, uh, we um, provide them that assistance and make sure that they uh, are always taken care of while they leave this center. Uh, next slide. Just quick stats uh, from 2013, 2020, when we first started, we have assisted over 15,675 clients uh, that have been linked to services. Uh, interesting point, 4% uh, of the clients that we have brought in for screening straight from prison to our, our, our center are returning citizens tested positive for illegal substances. And the thing that we've liked about what we're doing here in San Diego with our providers and our officers and our treatment um, providers and our clinicians is only 2% return to custody. Um, so we're trying to work on that number as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, what I'm gonna show you next is a quick video that, that of the Community Transition Center that will speak for itself and you'll be able to see uh, or hear from clients themselves and providers. Um, Brianna. Yes, thank you, Chief Gonzalez. I'm pulling that up right now and we'll share to the screen. It's complicated how you get all the way here and then you lose yourself like i don't even know what happened all of a sudden here we are life's halfway over and i'm starting over with criminal justice realignment the county of san diego realized that we needed to do something different with the realigned population we knew that we were not going to be able to incarcerate our way out of the situation so we really wanted to focus on a balanced approach. And what a balanced approach means is having services available at the same time providing accountability and structure. So the CTC at its heart is our mitigating program to allow for us to do some pre-release planning for folks who are being released from state prison. We are an assessment center. So what we do is we pick people up from state prison, we transport them home. We can make sure they get the things that they need to address our criminogenic needs. Located on site, we have a team of probation officers, a team of clinicians that work for Optum under the Health and Human Services Agency, who are licensed mental health clinicians. We have a nurse case manager, and then we have the treatment partners located with us, the Lighthouse. Our role here at the CTC is basically anything to do with behavioral health. Uh, we look at the offenders coming in, we do a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of their mental health needs, behavioral health needs, and we make sure that they get linked to services or at least get offered services that could support their recovery. It gave me an opportunity to get my life together and to uh, uh, put a plan together for a successful re-entry into society. The goal really is to get people ready for treatment, to start thinking about their lives with the CBT curriculum in particular, to get them to start thinking about their thinking and hopefully change the thinking, then change the behavior. The resources they provided, the, the care and the concern for us, like we weren't just crooks. We could be rehabilitated and we could be back into society and we can be walking shoulder and shoulder with each other to make our community a better place. 
the Lighthouse and the CTC together as collaborative partners has created a lot of magic um, with very difficult clients and providing services for them. And I think that it's a collaboration by, with all the different disciplines and having a common goal at the end of the day is that we're changing lives. When I walked in, if I would have known today that I was gonna be the woman that I am, I would have never believed it. My life today so far exceeds anything that I ever believed I was worthy of or, or capable of having after I had spiraled so far down. So today it's about how I can give back and who I can reach today, how I can contribute to life today rather than just, you know, have taken from it for so long. Thank you, Brianna. That completes my presentation. Sorry, I went Great. over time. No, you're good. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much to Mark, to Troy, and to Adolfo. Um, we so appreciate it. So we're going to go ahead and start Q&A. There's already some Q&A, um, some questions in the chat box. Um, so we can go ahead and start there. I'm going to ask everyone to keep them kind of brief and concise since we do have a lot of folks. We have over 100 folks on the call, so this is fantastic. Um, and then just a reminder, so we will not be able to get to all of the questions because there are so many of you. Um, but what we did want to do is um, to put the contact information up on screen. And so take a moment to jot these um, emails down so that you can connect with them. If you have any further questions or if your question doesn't get answered today, um, we definitely want you all to reach out. Um, and all of our presenters are willing and open. They, they provided their emails here and so they want to connect with each of you. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and start um, with the first question that was asked from Huva, which is, as a court-appointed psychologist evaluating competency, is there anything that I might be able to add to my report that would be helpful for people to be linked to services? And whoever wants to take a go at it can go ahead from the presenters. You are all muted at this time, though. Adolfo, can I, if I can go? Yeah, go ahead, please. I think the, the first thing I would say, if you can connect with um, your service providers in your community, I would start with the probation department and see if they have any resources or services that can help you uh, guide that questioning uh, to support the uh, individual coming out. Because it's key to work with our clients while they're still in custody and form a reentry plan before they come out and have the warm handoff and not just let them walk out the door or out the gate because we're sure that they're going to be successful. Excellent. Right. Thank and you also, so I think, too, understanding what's available in terms of being able to access people in terms of resources. So I would say, like, whether you are in Los Angeles or whatever part of the state you're in, you should be connecting with um, your county representatives um, because a lot of them have, like here in Los Angeles, we have um, re-entry into some case management team that is actually dealing with a lot of the landscape community health workers. They can kind of tell you what's going on. And then also within the jail system itself, there's all kind of um, necessary um, intake requirements for different program levels. And I think that's really where we need a better job of understanding what needs to be done as it relates to people being eligible for um, the services that are um, out there in the community because each program is under a different funding stream and has different eligibility requirements. So I think contacting the county first, asking what those requirements are, Department of Mental Health is one avenue that you can talk to. Um, uh, here in Los Angeles, we have the Office of Diversion and Reentry that has a lot of mental health um, beds and um, co-occurring disorder beds as well. Excellent, thank you so much to both of you for that response. Um, and so I will move on to the next one and then I'll go ahead and I see some that are popping up in the Zoom chat as well. Um, so somebody asked, what about services for the probation officers themselves? What kind of support are they getting? The 
we can go again. I think what we started here in San Diego about uh, maybe three, three years ago or four uh, years ago, we created a wellness unit. Part of the wellness unit is to help all of our employees, um, professional staff as well as sworn officers uh, through their um, spiritual, personal, mental, financial, whatever services they may need. Uh, and to go to a place that we created at the, near the training center that's separate from the rest of the working um, offices so people don't know who's coming or going because they're at the at one end of the, of the campus as opposed to the other end of the campus. And our, and our, our staff that's working in there uh, are, are experts and they assist all our employees with whatever needs they may have. And also they, they refer them to other uh, providers uh, as needed. Uh, but you're right, what we experience as probation officers, secondary trauma often uh, goes unchecked. Uh, we don't always take place. So to me, the wellness unit is, is, is something that, that is very important for the welfare and well-being of our employees. Excellent. Thank you so much for that one. Um, so I have a question here. Um, let me scroll up, actually, because I do want to get any of the older questions. Um, okay, so I see one here. Uh, how do we stop the cycle from jail to community to jail? When there is such a lack of resources, how do we engage folks into CBOs once released from jail and prison? I'll step in on this one. So look, the intersection of the criminal justice system and the mental health system, they are joined at the hip. One really, can, in, in terms of our population and NAMI and our family members and peers, one can't be successful without the other being successful. And, and in one sentence, if people can't get the level of care that they need, then um, at some point they're at very high risk of coming into contact with the criminal justice system. And now they have two problems. They not only have a mental health problem that needs to be addressed uh, in need of treatment, now they got a criminal justice problem. So, um, you know, I've been very vocal at the Permanent Steering Committee for the Office of Diversion and Entry that the two systems really need to work together. I, I actually personally think that the lack of access to acute and subacute care for the people who are the most seriously ill um, are the folks that are really going through the revolving door from the street to the jail to the hospital to the street back to the hospital back to the street back to the jail. You know, these are people who generally are, are very, very acutely ill. So, you know, it, it, there's no one, uh, you've got to, you can't just have a CIT program and think it's going to fix it. You can't just have a mental health court and think it's going to have fix it. You've got to do the entire sequential intercept model mapping process, map all the resources in your community. And at the same, so you're working with the mental health system to really discover where are the gaps, what beds do we have, what beds do we need, what programming do we need, and then also working with criminal justice form. And the two really have to become intermingled. So it's not an easy answer uh, because resources are tough, but you gotta work with what you have. And the, and you, and the way you, you, you fix it is you start. And that's what LA did five years ago. We got started. And the numbers were very small at the beginning and very frustrating. And now we're serving thousands of people and you can do the same in your communities. And your roadmap is the stepping up initiative. Yeah, and I'll just add that we, we have begun to, that mapping process now. Um, we had no choice, <laughs> to be honest with you, um, on two different efforts that have taken place. And there's reports that are out there and I can make those reports available to the, the NAMI leads. One is um, the ATI report that came out and it'll show you more in detail what Mark is referring to in terms of the intercept models, but also the recent report that we're getting ready to do with uh, as it relates to um, the closure of men's central jail. We've already been analyzing um, the number of beds um, based on acuity level, both inside and in community, what's is available, and now we're creating the mapping for that. Um, so um, we can send several reports that we're using as our source documentation to this group um, so they can make it available to you guys. That would be great. Thank you so much, Troy. And thank you, Mark, for your response as well. Um, so this one, uh, probably to Mark and Troy as well, since you all are in the Los Angeles area, someone is asking if there is a community transition center in Los Angeles and just wondering if 
if so, can they have uh, contact information? I can go ahead and link it if, if you all mention any. Troy, you should take this one because I, I don't think I know the, the answer to this. Yeah, there, there's, well, there's no real community transition center um, per se. Um, there is community transition efforts <laughs> that I well, probably would probably say for accurately. Um, not 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 disrelated. So you know, um, different opportunities from people coming out. So for example, if people are coming out of the prison system, there's a STOP program, and STOP is a, a network of providers that are separate, directly related to the prison system. Um, there's also efforts um, here in Los Angeles. We have a program called Doors, and Doors is basically a community um, center for probationers um, that we partner with the um, Office of Diversion and Reentry Probation Department and a lot of community-based organizations are housed in one location and so people that are on probation currently can access those resources that are readily available in real time. Now what I will say is that we're also um, in process of putting um, more such centers up in different serv um, um, service planning areas. Los Angeles is complicated because it has five supervisorial districts and, and, they're, and the landscape is different. And so a one size fits all model really is not applicable in our region. We need something that is more diverse that is applicable to the diverse regions that make up Los Angeles. Absolutely, great point, Troy. Yes, Adolfo? Good comment based on what Mark was saying regarding funding. Uh, we, we didn't have funding for our mandatory supervision clients. Uh, the county was able to get some um, grants through uh, drug medical, and we started what we call a CTC, a community, community transition center like. Um, the only difference is that we don't have a brick and mortar yet, and our deputy chief, Colonel Lau, is the one uh, responsible for that or carrying that mission forward uh, through our collaborative reentry services. And if you um, give me the information, I can relay her information if anybody needs it. But she's done a ter terrific job in trying to manage that for a different population. You're right, Mark. Certain funding for certain population and other funding for other populations. But yet they had the same individual. The individual may have similar needs. You know, and I, and I think the way it happened in Lo Los Angeles is, you know, when District Attorney Jackie Lacey convened the county back in 2015, which led to the blueprint for change, which led to $130 million of appropriations for ODR, Office of Diversion Reentry. So as advocates, NAMI folks, you know, you've got to, you need to find a civic leader, an elected official who's willing to convene the county. When your presiding judge calls a meeting, everybody wants to be there, everybody wants to show. When your district attorney calls for a meeting, everybody's going to want to show it. You've got to, you need your maverick. You need your leader who, who has the power of their office to convene the county. And then you have to, look, budgets have been crushed. So we got to learn to use the resources that we have better and wiser and more with more smarts. And then we've got to figure out what we need and build the plan for funding. And it's a five to 10 year plan. It's not going to happen in a few months. We need to be the noise. We need to be the human face of mental illness just like we are in CIT training, but get a, get a seat at your county table and, and you know, make them aware of where the gaps are, where people are falling through the floor, uh, through the abyss, and then you know, make your county address that and remedy it. You know, we, we can be the catalyst for change. Uh, you know, we may not know how to fix a probation department, but we can make a lot of noise People like the chief are going to remedy the situation and, and try to come up with solutions. So, you know, you're the advocacy, uh, you know, the thrust of advocacy, really, and the human face of mental illness. Absolutely. Thank you so much to the three of you for your input on that one. Um, so it is 11.08 a.m. and I do want to be mindful of folks who are going to be hopping off of this call and going to a different um, session. The session that uh, is right after this one on this same call um, is supporting a loved one uh, in and through the criminal justice system with Anita, Valerie, and Hal. So if you're going to stay on for that, you can go ahead and, and just remain on this call. But if you are going to attend a different workshop, um, I will recommend that um, as we wrap up now that you can have some time to go get onto that next call. Um, Adolfo, was that a hand or?
Was that a supportive hand? Well, thank you everybody for being here. Great, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone for your meaningful dialogue, your amazing questions. Uh, and thank you to each of the presenters. They will be on to listen to the next uh, workshop. Um, but we are so, so appreciative of the three of you for sharing your insight um, and for offering up your email addresses. So hopefully folks who didn't get their questions answered can connect one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Thank you guys. And I'll just add one quick thing. I've received some questions from the audience about their own personal family circumstances. So actually my Zoom support group is tonight. You have my email, if you wanna join, send me an email, I'll send you a link and we can talk through uh, family stuff tonight, okay? Definitely, thank you so much for doing that, Mark. And yes, yeah. for the individuals who mentioned that on the Whova, I went ahead and put the email directly into your, uh, your question as a reply. Um, Thanks, so you'll see, yeah, you'll see Mark's email in there. All righty. Um, so with that,